D-Day, the name which the Allied media gave to the Normandy landings of June 6, 1944, is an event which has been viewed very largely from an Allied perspective. Considering the colossal challenges which the Allies faced, and the bravery with which their troops carried out the landings, this is in some ways understandable. However, what has been overlooked for years are the experiences from the other side. This video series intends to bring them to light. These stories come from the book D-Day Through German Eyes, The Hidden Story of June 6, 1944 by author Holger Eckerts. They have been edited by myself to make them accessible in this format. What comes out is a highly revealing series of factual accounts by German soldiers who experienced the full might of the Allied onslaught on D-Day, especially in the bunkers and so-called resistance points constructed along the front line. These accounts show a side to the battle that is rarely seen, the motivations of individual German soldiers, their thought processes as the invasion unfolded, and the way they sought to fight back against the Allies in the violent and chaotic hours after the initial landings. I would like to emphasize that the interviewees whose testimonies are recorded here demonstrate a wide range of attitudes to their wartime experience. Some were remorseful for their service in the German forces. Some appeared to have changed only slightly, while others, as the listener will hear, were conflicted, traumatized or otherwise affected by the cataclysmic events of June 6. All of them are human. These, are their stories. Welcome, to Trench Diaries. Omaha Beach Part 1 Unteroffizier Henrik Nauba I think the first time I heard these codenames, Omaha, Utah, Sword and so on, was in late 1946 when I was working in a car factory that was being managed by British engineers in Germany. I got to know some of these British people very well and when I told them where I was taken prisoner by the Americans, they said, Oh. So you must have been on Omaha Beach, I landed on Sword Beach, or, my brother was on Juno Beach, and things like that. Of course, these terms meant nothing to me. We Germans had no knowledge of Allied terminology until recently. The first time I heard the phrase, D-Day, was also after the war ended. During the war, we Germans referred to it as the invasion of France or the Normandy attack. To me, it is Vier Via. That was the name of our position, which was a resistance point. I was posted there in April 1944 and we were inspected by Rommel himself shortly after my arrival. I saw Rommel personally. He was a very energetic and active man. He walked very briskly and spoke rapidly. I did not have any dialogue with him, but he came to our position and spoke with our officer. He asked very factual questions about the amount of ammunition we had in the post, how old the weapons were what we knew of the design of Allied ships and so on. He was quite a short man, but had a very powerful presence, although, as with all famous leaders, how much of this was due to our expectations and preconceptions is difficult to say. In the days and weeks before the invasion there was a feeling of great tension, because we were constantly watching and waiting for a possible attack. We all believed that the Allies would try to attack Europe in the summer of 1944, and the summer was reaching its height so a landing of some sort seemed inevitable. The amount of bombing by aircraft and strafing by fighter bombers was also building up enormously in May and early June, and this had to be a prelude to some kind of event. Our warning level went up to level 2 on the weekend before the invasion. But, if I remember correctly, it came down again to level 3 on Monday the 5th. The waiting was very unnerving, and also the issue of constantly worrying about what kind of attack we would face. Would it be by air, or by landing boats, or in conjunction with the communist fighters in the French resistance, or a combination of all of these? Would it be against us in the north, or also on the western coast of France? All these questions plagued us, and there were no answers. And every day, the sea in front of our resistance point looked exactly the same, giving us no clues at all. A so-called resistance point was an area of about 30 meters width and 10 meters depth, set on the top of some cliffs beside one of the ravines that led down to the beach wall. The point had a trench across its width, and several running to the rear in jagged lines. Inside, these trenches had concrete walls and wooden floors with drainage points. Outside, there was a raised concrete parapet about one meter high, in which there were firing points, which were vertical slits. There were two machine guns, 
one at either end aiming through these slits. It was about 300 meters down from the cliff to the nearest part of the sea wall, and there was a long, uninterrupted line of fire along the beach to the northwest. The machine guns were MG-42, which were extremely powerful. The resistance point was surrounded by barbed wire with a single exit point at the rear, and the dunes on top of the cliffs around it were mined. There were also mines hanging on cables down the cliffs, which could be dropped on any attackers from the beach. The position was open to the air, but steel covers were available to drag across the trenches in case of a bombardment. To be honest, we also used these if it rained heavily. The position had a searchlight between the two guns, and a reinforced area for ammunition and grenade storage. Our team was 10 men strong. Two men on each gun, the others being observers and sentries and men intended to fire from the trenches onto the beach with rifles. A second team, equally strong, was either resting or working nearby. We had a small villa as a headquarters adjacent to the officer's post. We were commanded by a Feltfable, and our officer commanded four such positions along the high ground in the area. On the other side of the ravine that went down to the sea wall, the cliffs continued, with further resistance points built along there. We were ordered to keep a constant lookout of course, and make regular reports by wire to our officer's post, which was about one kilometer behind us. In case of an attack, we were told specifically to hold our fire until any enemy troops were 400 meters from the edge of the beach. Although the MG-42 could fire effectively beyond 2,000 meters, this instruction was intended to ensure that we had the largest possible target area on each attacking soldier. We were told to fire at their chests when their torsos were above water, that is to say when they reached the shallows and were waiting. We were trained constantly on the importance of our task. If the Allies were allowed to gain a foothold in our sector, however slender, their huge material resources would allow them to build it up and threaten the whole of France. This in turn would give them a puppet state to use in order to harass and blockade Germany itself. The concept of the Allies actually invading Germany seemed unimaginable at the time. Our officers sought to educate us very thoroughly on this matter. They emphasized that if an attempted landing could be defeated by us on the shoreline and thrown back, it would take years for the Western Allies to recover, allowing us to consolidate a defensive line against the Soviets in the East. A failed invasion would have a devastating effect on Western public opinion and might even force the English out of the war altogether. That idea was constantly emphasized. All in all, we were fully aware of the great burden of responsibility resting on us as the first line of defense against an attack. The preceding day, Monday the 5th, was very blustery and wet and we were on duty in blocks of two hours on, two hours off. The tension was very noticeable, because of the intensity of the aerial bombing. Throughout the weekend and the Monday, that is the 3rd, 4th and the 5th, there were heavy raids overnight to the southeast, and fighter-bomber attacks during the daytime. The fighter-bombers usually flew over us and went inland, they only occasionally strafed the beach. This is something I found strange when I thought about the invasion afterwards. The level of attacks on our beach were very intense at the last minute, but very low in the previous days and weeks. I suppose this was to prevent us from deducing that an attack was impending on our specific beach but the fighter bombers could have caused much more disruption to us than they did before the landing. On June 6 I was on duty in the resistance point, at the western corner MG slot from 2 AM onwards. As we went up to the point in the dark, there was heavy bombing to the south again and a very high level of aircraft noise. There was flak fire from points in a semicircle inland of us and further explosions in the distance. We all agreed that something was up, something was going to happen soon. This did not cause us alarm. I think that most of us were simply sick of the tension of waiting and waiting. An event of some kind, even an attack, would at least break the tension and the silence, the sense of foreboding that we had. For this reason some of our men said, let them come soon, which made other men smile and laugh but I think we all preferred to have the situation resolved, to let us start fighting at last rather than waiting. From 2 a.m. up to the landing itself the level of noise and explosions rose and fell. As the moon was full, we could see large numbers of aircraft in the sky at times between the rain clouds and there were various flames and explosions in the sky on the inland side. Several times we saw an aircraft on fire, heading out across the sea towards England and in some cases these burning planes descended and appeared to hit the sea in the distance. On our gun I was the gunner, 
and my loader and I both had good quality binoculars. Using these I saw that many of the aircraft were twin-engine types and we debated whether these were bombers or something else. I know today that we were seeing the airborne infantry transports returning and scattering over the sea. I recall seeing one of these planes at low altitude followed very closely by another plane which we thought appeared to be a glider under tow. These two planes descended rapidly and disappeared into the sea. All this went on and we became increasingly convinced that an attack from the sea would come soon, as some kind of assault was evidently already happening inland. Our officer appeared at about 4 am, bringing with him the other team whom he had woken and he ordered us all to be completely prepared for a possible sea landing. I think that first light came at about 5 am and it slowly revealed the beach to us. Nothing was changed there. The sand was studded with large numbers of steel obstacles and these were very prominent as the tide was out. The sky was overcast and the offshore wind was quite strong. As time passed, with my binoculars I scanned the horizon and I began to see many shapes materialize. The sea was slightly foggy out there but I could still see a handful of shapes, then more, and finally an absolute wall of these grey outlines stretching almost across the entire horizon. All of us who had binoculars stood and stared at this apparition, while the other men demanded to know what we were looking at. We handed the binoculars around for a few seconds and many of the men took a look. Their reactions varied, ranging from curses to a kind of apprehensive laughter or just silence. In the meantime our felt fable was on the cable phone speaking to the officer's post. He came to us at the parapet and said, men, they're coming now, they're coming in strength. We must be ready, or something straightforward like that. The whole situation was unfolding in a way that seemed almost like a dream, detached from reality. This great assembly of ships was simply looming out of the sea mist, just getting bigger and bigger, closer and closer and nothing at all was happening on our side. I could not hear any firing from our coastal batteries further along the coast and no Luftwaffe aircraft were visible overhead. The sea between us and the ships was completely empty, there was not a torpedo boat or a seaplane or anything. I had a great sensation that we were on our own in front of this colossal force. It was very strange. It felt like a great, almost superhuman challenge. It was unnerving but I also felt a certain relief, even excitement that at last we would meet this enemy that threatened us. At the same time, like soldiers everywhere, I busied myself with my gun and with getting our position as ready as possible. At this point, a very large formation of enemy bombers came over us. These were the big four-engine bombers which I think were the Lancaster type. We saw them streaming towards us over the ships on the sea and a nearby 20mm flak gun fired on them, but they were too high in altitude. They bombed us and we threw ourselves under the steel covers, fearing the worst. These bombs came down at an angle from the sky, almost diagonally and the explosions made the whole cliff shake and sway under us. But we realized that if we were the target, they were missing. The bombs hit the inland areas behind us instead. This was a great relief and we laughed in a nervous, apprehensive manner as the sound of the planes moved away inland too. We climbed up and prepared ourselves, with the massive fleet of ships on the sea getting closer by the second. The slit in the concrete parapet gave a wide arc of fire and I practiced sweeping the gun left and right, which I had done countless times in drills. Just as I was doing this, the sea bombardment began. I did expect this kind of bombardment, but the intensity was astonishing. It was heavier and also far more accurate than the bomber planes that had just tried to hit us. I had been under artillery fire on the eastern front of course, where I learned to brace myself against it both physically and mentally. That was difficult enough for me and for most others. This bombardment however was by warship cannons. That was obvious from the flashes that we could see on the horizon, among the many outlines of the advancing ships and then the noise of the shells approaching us in the air. These shells made a noise similar to a blowtorch being run at full strength and at first they passed right overhead. We could actually see them as bright shapes flying inland over the beach. They were huge shapes too, about the size of a car engine or similar. They exploded a few hundred meters behind us and then the next salvo came down much closer. We dragged the steel plates over our trench covers and huddled underneath them with our guns. The power of the explosions made the concrete of the trench ripple and fracture and if I glanced up, I could only see enormous spouts of earth and sand hanging over the dunes and the beach. The shockwaves punched all the air out of our lungs and made our eyes bleed. 
The shrapnel that flew around us was monstrous in size. I saw one piece of shell as big as my arm, which simply fell down out of the air and jangle at the end of the trench, still smoking. But other pieces were flying left and right horizontally, screeching and smashing off the parapet and the steel roof plates. It went on and on, salvo after salvo, with absolutely no pause in between the impacts. It was as if a gigantic hammer was falling on the beach, trying to pound it flat. That is how it felt to me. Most of the men remained calm and disciplined. My loader was trembling as he crouched there and as I noticed this, I realized that I was also trembling. One man near me could not take the stress and he tried to run by ducking outside of the trench zone which was covered overhead by the steel screens. I saw him try to run. He was caught by an absolute storm of shrapnel and his entire torso was ripped open from front to back. He fell in the open part of the trench and countless other bits of debris fell on him, mutilating him further. His body produced a lot of steam in the cool air, which filled the trench for a while. This was a terrible and shocking sight for those of us who saw it. At one point, the end of the concrete trench was blown open by one of these shells and showering us with earth and debris. When the smoke from this cleared, it meant that we could see out of the end of the trench and down to the beach for some distance. It was possible to see the shells landing in salvos of three. Each salvo made very tall plumes of smoke and debris that slowly fell to the ground. I saw one of the shells explode inside one of the other resistance points about 500 meters from us. That point was similar in design to ours but with a single machine gun and a concrete to brook bunker. The whole installation was destroyed and pieces of concrete were thrown high into the air, with the bodies of the men who were in it. It was terrifying to watch those men flung out, knowing that the same thing could happen to us at any time if we were hit directly. In the end however, there was a final intense barrage of shells and then the shelling stopped altogether.